Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello, I'm your host, Matt Sands, and welcome to another episode of the Mineral Rights Podcast. For those of you who've been listening for a while and wonder who Justin Williams is, today we're going to do a proper introduction and I'm going to interview him. So um, stay tuned for that. And if you'd like to learn more about my background, Justin will be interviewing me in a future episode. So please subscribe so you won't miss out. And also in the meantime, you can listen to the, I guess, episode zero of the Mineral Rights Podcast, where I do a brief introduction of myself and a little bit about my history. Before we get started, go to mineralrightspodcast.com for the show notes and for any links mentioned on the show. And as we always say, please subscribe and leave a rating on iTunes. If there's any way that this show has helped you out, all that we ask is take a minute and a half and um, leave that rating on iTunes. That really helps us out and we'll make sure that we reach all of the mineral owners that need to hear this information. So now on with the show. So my, de- my guest today is my sidekick, Justin Williams. Justin is a small business owner and his family has a portfolio of minerals that he manages. And just a little bit about how Justin got involved with the show. He is a fellow listener who heard the first couple of shows and reached out at the beginning to offer help to get the word out to other mineral owners. So definitely you know, give a lot of thanks to Justin every time just for the value that he adds to the show. And since then, he's been kind of the super guest on the show and helped provide the individual mineral owner's perspective. So welcome back to the show, Justin. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you having me as always and have enjoyed being a part of the show. Thanks. And so I'm going to start drilling you with some questions here and we'll get started at the beginning. So I know that you grew up in West Texas, but I don't know much else. So can you tell me a little bit about your background growing up in West Texas and what, what that was like? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born and raised in Odessa, Texas, um, and it was, uh, for lack of better words, uh, flat and dry. Um, It was an oil-filled city, and I, I, growing up, didn't really know any different other than oil wells and running around in the fields. As I got older, we kind of saw the bus go down, and I saw Odessa kind of dry up and everybody move out. And that's as I, as I started to realize, okay, this is, you know, this is kind of abnormal compared to other places. As I got older into my middle ages, I moved away from Odessa and down to the south in Alabama where I went to school. And ever since then, I've just kind of been drawn back to that area just because of the heritage and the oil history and everything that is there in that part of the country. And Odessa is just a small piece of it. The whole part of West Texas is that way. Yeah. I imagine you get to know everybody on a first name basis there in a, in a small town, at least in the part of town that you live in. Is is that kind of your experience? Absolutely. I mean, it was, you know, four or five blocks and you pretty much knew everybody by name. Um, you also knew most of the guys that had worked in the oil fields together for their entire lives. So how, how did your family get down to Odessa? Did your dad work in the oil field or what was that all about? Yeah, so both of my, both sides of my parents, their families worked in the oil fields. Um, and my father eventually started working in petroleum plants at Huntsman in Odessa. But my grandfather was in the oil fields his entire life along with his family. Um, and my grandfather was actually wrote the records for the oil wells. So I grew up kind of looking back at his handwriting and looking back at the different logs and things like that and just thinking they were amazing. But I come from both sides of working in the oil fields. And I think most people in Odessa their family had something to do with it because that was the major supporter of careers in industry. Yeah, it makes sense. So you mentioned you went to school in Alabama. Where did you go to school? So I actually went to high school in Decatur, Alabama, and I graduated from Austin High School and then went to college in Athens, Alabama and received my MBA there. It's also where I met my wife. Um, I always tell everyone I got the best thing from the South, which is a Southern woman, and I got out of there. <laughs> yeah, it's a little more humid in Alabama than it is in Odessa. You know, I having lived in Houston, I know how that how that can feel. So I don't blame you. No, absolutely. And and now living in Colorado, I'm uh, very blessed, and I, I never knew how beautiful it was here. But there is no extreme in Colorado. Cool. Well, so you went to school in Alabama. What what did you get your degree in? So an MBA with a marketing specialization. Um, I was originally going to go into managing businesses and ended up owning my own business, which worked out great, but was never really in the cards. Interesting. So what what kind of business was that starting out? So starting out, I actually uh, owned a technology business and a software development business. And I found that I just loved the entrepreneurial path. 
and building something that was my own. When I very first came out of school, I went to work in corporate America and was I, I found myself extremely miserable within six months of just working the corporate grind. And I knew very quickly that was not going to be for me. And so that first job you had out of school, that was, was that doing marketing or using your degree or what, or what were you doing? It was, it was. I was actually a, a manager of marketing for a critical power company and I was managing a sales team. And I learned so much with just for the crash course of life. Uh, but again, I just, the corporate grind and the everyday, I just knew that that wasn't going to be something that was going to be for me for the rest of my life. But at that point, I had no idea how to change it. Hmm, yeah. So how did you switch gears though to get, to get out of the corporate grind and then getting into the software development business? So I started uh, forsaking my weekends and just trying entrepreneurial efforts and then eventually was able to save up enough money to where I could take some time and pursue my entrepreneurial passions. Um, the first business was a complete flop, of, as usual, I think. Um, and then as time went on, I worked some other jobs in between and eventually got into stained glass. My wife's family, uh, her family came from doing stained glass and I eventually went for a couple of years to Alabama, worked at her mother's studio and got to know the art form and the passion. And we both just kind of fell in love, started a business focused around that. And then everything was just as it should have been and kind of fell into place. Okay. So that's kind of takes you to today. So you and your wife, I, I do know that you run a company called Little Glass Art. Is, is that right? Yep, that's correct. And we do, we teach glass uh, classes focused on the stained glass medium and pretty much any glass medium. And then we also do commissions and repairs and all the other fun stuff. Okay. So you can do a class. So tell me a little bit about if I were to sign up for one of your classes, kind of walk me through what that experience is like. Yeah, absolutely. So and we kind of cater to two different markets. Um, we're here for the people who just want to come out and have fun and try something. And then we're also there for the people who really want to expand learning the medium. For our fun classes, we kind of bring you in and it's about a three hour class. You come in and you complete a stained glass sun catcher in the method used to create a lamp. So you get 100% the real experience, but it's broken down into something that anybody can complete even if they've never done something like this. Um, and that's a big part of what we think makes it fun for the average Joe. Um, and then we also offer classes. If you want to make a Tiffany lamp at the end of the day, we have classes that lead all the way up to that if it's for you. Cool. Yeah. So one last question on the um, kind of the background here. So your your studio, it's uh, located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Correct. How can people find out more about that if they want to, if they're in that area and want to sign up for a class? I know you do classes in Denver as well, but where, where can we uh, find out more about that? Absolutely. The best place is our website, which is littleglassart.co. Um, and that has all of the listings of our upcoming classes and all the different classes we teach. Uh, but as you mentioned, we have two different locations. One's on Brighton Boulevard in Denver, and then one is in Colorado Springs, um, where we teach those classes and then also do one-on-one -on -one sessions. But best way to get in contact with us is definitely the website, which is littleglassart.co, and you give us a call or an email from there. Okay, cool. All right. So now I know people are listening to this because they want to hear more about mineral rights. So I'm going to switch gears for, for a moment and let's let's dive into your mineral, your, your experience with mineral rights and your family's experience. So, so at a high level, can you tell me a little bit more about how you got involved with minerals and royalties? Absolutely. So in my family, it actually all started in the early 50s. My great, great uncle and his brother were partners in a business in the oil fields. Um, and they actually started out in Oklahoma working in the oil fields. Um, and it took several years before the younger brother was actually able to get a job on the oil rigs because everybody said he was too short. So eventually they got into it together. Um, they worked in Oklahoma and eventually moved up to West Texas where it was just beginning to boom. And they went into business together working in the oil fields. Originally they were drilling leases for Marathon Oil. And then kind of went on from there and morphed as, um, as they went on. Eventually, one of the brothers left the oil field career and one stayed in. And most of our mineral rights come from his successes and his time spent in the oil industry. Okay. So it's sort of a family legacy then. So your, your uncle got started. You got involved when you inherited them. Is that correct? That's correct. Absolutely. It was actually, it was a funny thing because in the downturn of the 2000s, when things were just so much slower in West Texas, um, it's kind of when all these things changed hands. And most of the heirs actually were not even aware that they existed until in recent years when the oil fields have heated back up. And it's, you know, we have people knocking down the door saying, hey, here's some information. Yeah, that, 
is often the case, I think, where people don't find out about it until there's a permit and somebody's getting an offer to uh, lease or to buy minerals and they're they're just trying to figure out what to do. So, I mean, how did you do that? You know, finding out that you owned minerals, kind of thrown into it in the middle of maybe needing to learn information fast, you know, where, where did you get started? Absolutely. So the, the first thing was a call to us that somebody was actually looking for us when they were looking for us to sign. And I believe it was a pooling authorization at the time. Um, and of course, the first question that always comes up, I think for any mineral right owner is, wow, that's great. How much more is out there? So step one was trying to figure out, okay, is this it? What else is there? Is this correct? And the first place that we started was with talking with an attorney. I and mean, thankfully, we, we were very lucky with the attorney, and he was very frank with us and telling us, hey, look, there's I can do this for you at a huge price tag per hour, or you can go to the county online records and try to look for as much as you can. Start there before I get involved. And that's exactly what we did. We started in the county in which we were approached in and did some mineral rights. And then from there, we kind of started doing some statewide searches, which some websites offer, and then just kind of started drilling things down from there. Um, eventually, we were able to go back and actually get an inventory of the estate, which made things much easier for our, for us to have an idea, okay, what do we need to try to look at and drill down? Okay. So you did some online searching. You found out some information from that. That inventory of the estate that you mentioned, where where did that come from? Was that from a will or how did you um, land on that? That's correct. So we actually were able to get that from the will. And so we went into the county in which his will was probated, and uh, we actually contacted the county. And they were actually able to email us a copy of that inventory of his estate, which was filed with the probate of his will. Okay. Well, that's lucky. At least you had the the will that went through probate. I know a lot of, you know, owners, they die in testate where they don't have a will. And then all of a sudden you just, you get a, you know, notice, Hey, we'd like to lease. And then you're like, okay, well, wh- what is this about? And then where is, where else? Do they might might they have minerals and yeah it's hard to f- kind of get to the bottom of it if you don't have some sort of records but well that's good so so will was probated and you got the inventory now what what did you do next the biggest thing for us and I think this was certainly the thing that took me the longest to understand was we we ended up finding out that due to a title issue so inside of the actual will itself there were a couple different trusts created and it wasn't clear which one was used to transfer the property. And because of that, there were several properties that actually were not reaching out to us because of the title issue. And that for me was one of the biggest things to kind of wrap my head around and say, okay, I need to contact these companies and I need to identify who these companies are and see what I need to do to fix that problem. And it became, um, you know, Matt, you and I have had several conversations about it, but it came this big animal that had to be solved, which was very fruitful to solve it, but some, just a totally different thing to understand. And a question I've always played in my head is I wonder how many people, how many other mineral right owners aren't getting somebody knocking on their door because there is a title issue and they just have no idea. Yeah. And oftentimes it just, you don't know that it's out there until somebody contacts you. Maybe they want to purchase your minerals and maybe they know there's some a title issue, but then you just have to work through with them. Oh, what do you need me to do? What do I need to do? And then you have to also educate yourself. So you, you sounds like you got some good, you know, counsel from that attorney in terms of what to do to, to do it in a cost efficient manner. What, you know, was the, some of the biggest resources or tips that you found were helpful in in learning more about what you owned and kind of the ins and outs of that? The biggest thing for me was consuming what, what is out there on the internet. And this is one of those things that Unfortunately, there is there. Fortunately, there is lots of good information out there for mineral right owners, but unfortunately, not all of it is very specific to your scenario. So for me, I think the miracle really was picking up the phone and talking to several different people. Um, and I was very fortunate that a lot of the people that I spoke to, they were very honest and saying, "Hey, this is not really at a point for me to help you, but here's what you're working on." And then just slowly connecting the dots as you're learning about this. And I think just continuing to push the ball forward and not getting frustrated is key. Because as you know, Matt, it's so much information to take on at once, especially when you know nothing about it. Yeah, it's like drinking through a fire hose, that old analogy. I think that for me, you know, I've seen a lot of people going to Mineral Rights Forum as a just as a specific example. And I always find that even though I've been in the industry for almost 20 years, you can get some real useful information about activity levels in specific counties, maybe where you own minerals. 
And that's some of the more specific information to your point about there being a lot of generic information out there relative to maybe leasing or different documents that you come across in the state planning and whatnot. But when you get into, okay, I own minerals in Reeves County, Texas, what is the going lease re- leasing rate right now? And you know, I got this lease offer on the table. What do I do next? Can you tell me a little bit about your specific experience in, in leasing and sort of kind of how you've gone about that? You know, you got contacted, you know, with uh, a pooling notice and then I guess have you gotten you know, you've gotten several oil and gas lease offers as well from our, our conversations. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, it's one of those things that I, it definitely warrants having somebody that you trust that can give you counsel. And that's kind of been the case as we've been working to develop a relationship with an attorney that can kind of review this stuff. But there's also a level of self-education that you have to go through because when you want to be able to look at these lease offers and at least know, hey, this is about right for the area, or this is what I'm thinking. And like you mentioned, a lot of times I found myself going to the mineral rights forum and posting a question and saying, hey, I've received this what is going on in the area. And you'll find that that those educated people and those people who really are around that in the everyday will answer those questions for you and try to keep you informed best they can. And just trying to make an, an educated decision is one of the best things. Another thing with, with leasing that I found is it's a great idea not to have your eggs in one basket. If you can have more than one company, a lot of times they'll be willing to give you information that the other one won't just to kind of balance the deal or to try to keep things moving forward in their favor. And it's really helped me to have an honest offer by having a couple different companies, keeping the other one honest and keeping everything moving forward. So you're, you're talking about soliciting other companies to see if they're interested in leasing as well. Is that what, what you mean by that? Absolutely. And, and even if they're not interested in leasing, a lot of times they can give you some valuable information about the area or what they even know about the area. Well, that's a, yeah, that's a useful tip. I find that a lot of times they're very open, especially if they, I mean, they're, they're there to serve you. If you talk to the owner relations department or a division owner analyst, they're there to serve you and you're their, one of their customers. And, you know, certainly it doesn't hurt to ask is, is always like, like we always say. So, okay. So you've, you've gotten enough to know to, to be dangerous now. So what, what was the biggest learning that you got at that point, you know, since you got involved and you sort of started learning about the ins and outs of minerals and, and leasehold interest. And can you tell me a little bit about like, what, what's the biggest thing that you've taken away from that process? Absolutely. And with leasing, one of the things that, you know, it, it can seem fairly, fairly cut and dry that you just take the lease from them. You have somebody look at it. They say, Hey, it doesn't look like there's anything too crazy in here. You sign it, return it, you get your signing bonus. But as I've learned more about mineral rights, it really is something that you have to actively manage uh, for a couple of reasons. One, there you want to be sure that you utilize your mineral rights the best you can, whether that be putting in depth limitations or whether that be being sure that they're careful about how long they can hold that lease by production or also just being sure that the royalties you're receiving once you are receiving the checks is correct because that's not – a lot of times I think people can take it for granted – the oil companies try to do the best they can, but they do make mistakes, and it's up to the mineral right owner to catch those, identify those, and be sure that they're um, working to correct them. Okay, so kind of continually auditing your portfolio, looking at whether it's in a process of you know being un- non-producing and you're in the, in the leasing stages, or if you have a producing well, you're receiving royalties to make sure that the the checks are matching what you should be getting paid based on the lease that you signed. That's, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that I found. You know, I thought sort of, you know, at the beginning, getting into the business, you sort of think about this, you know, mailbox money comes in and it's a, you know, all of a sudden you can just sit back and relax and not have to do anything. But it's definitely where there is some work involved with actively managing those to make sure that you're getting what you deserve. And sort of that's our mission here at the Mineral Rights Podcast. And I, I know that you know, we share that passion of trying to get that information out to other mineral owners to make sure that they understand that and that they have the tools and the resources to actively manage their, their portfolio. So, so that is, that is a good tip. So, you know, along those same lines, what is the biggest tip you could give other mineral, mineral owners who might be in the same boat as you were, and maybe they just found out that they inherited minerals and or royalties or, leasehold interest from a relative, you know, what, what's the, 
number one thing you would you would say, hey, you need to go do this? I would definitely say that it's it's a process of self education, and I think for families, it's not always everybody in the family that's right for that process of self education, but it really helps to have somebody who's willing to dive in and learn about them and try to be sure that they can get the most value from those minerals as possible. You were mentioning, you know, they say investing, it's not a hold and hope kind of thing. And mineral rights investments certainly aren't a hold and hope kind of thing. It's something that it definitely, you know, behooves you to find somebody who can help you to manage those. If it's enough, you can find third parties who are willing to help you manage those. But it's, I think it's certainly worth either self-educating yourself or finding somebody in the family that you can trust to help learn about those and help you to manage those and to you know, take on learning everything there is to know to be able to be sure that that legacy is left. Something else I see often with people is don't be afraid to go back and other, ask other heirs questions. It seems that this information gets lost in certain gaps, but it's nice to have a clear picture. And sometimes going digging for the history is just as valuable as going digging for the facts in the county courthouse and everything else. Yeah. And I think to add on to that, you know, we talk about this is the assuming you're going to keep your minerals, you find out that you've inherited them and it, it's of interest to you to take the time or you have the time to dedicate to learn about what you need to be doing to to manage them. On the flip side of that, though, I know I spoke with a mineral owner yesterday who in his comment to me was, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in selling. I know, I know, you know, there's upside potential here and all that, but at the end of the day, he's, you know, retired and is thinking about estate planning and he wants to leave his daughters with, you know, nice lump sum of cash that they can just go enjoy rather than giving them a lot of uh, paperwork headaches because maybe they're not equipped to to manage those minerals and, and royalties. And, and he sort of was in your situation where he found out about some minerals when he got an offer. He has a lease offer a couple of years ago and he signed a lease and then he had a purchase offer and he just kind of remembered, oh yeah, I've got these out here that I inherited from a, an uncle. I don't really have time or the desire to get into the business of management. So I'm going to actively look for purchase offers. And so, you know, everybody's got to assess kind of my, my point there being that everybody's got to assess their personal goals. And, you know, at the end of the day, in the long run, if there's going to be oil and gas development in your area, you're going to benefit most financially by holding on to those mineral rights. You know, typically there is a risk associated with that, but if you're willing to to deal with that risk, then you know the upside potential can be quite large. On the flip side of that, though, you know there is a definite case for if it maybe is not something for you, that risk is too high. Maybe you need cash now, or you just want to clean up your your estate so that uh, your heirs can enjoy the benefits of those minerals, but maybe not the, the headaches associated with them. So, so there's you know kind of two sides to that coin as well. Just to to throw that in there, but absolutely, and and it's so individual for each person. And this is something that you know an estate plan for one person doesn't fit the other. And and this is certainly something that has a certain niche in the estate plan. And, and like you mentioned, I mean, I can absolutely understand why somebody would want to pass on the lump sum of cash rather than the mineral right royalties. And that's something to talk with your financial advisor about and find out what would be the right person thing for your heirs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So any other advice that you would like to give to fellow mineral owners that might be just getting started? I think the biggest thing that for me was don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask questions to everyone and anyone who will let you. And if they don't have an answer, that's okay. Just ask it to the next person. Yeah, that's always key. Um, find a good advisor. And that might include attorneys, accountants, people in the minerals industry. If you have some consultants, whether that's an engineer or a landman that can help answer some of those questions like Justin mentioned. And we hope to fill that role a little bit. So if you do have any questions that maybe you've tried those avenues and you just really still aren't getting the answer, send it to us. We um, are going to have a QA and a episode here coming up soon. And so look forward to that. And you know, send us some your questions so that we can make sure that you uh, are getting the information you need. And one last question I have for you, Justin, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up? No, I think we did a pretty good recap. You know, one of the things that I think that I've enjoyed as I've gotten to the mineral rights that I never thought I would, but I've really found myself taking a liking and an interest to the history of how the industry has developed and all the passion and the hard work people have put into 
building a future for themselves. And I think that's pretty prominent in the oil industry. And it, it's sure a story of American entrepreneurialism and success. Amen to that. Yeah. You know, lots of entrepreneurs in the oil and gas industry. And uh, that's, you know, where a lot of these um, oil and gas companies got started with uh, somebody with a pickup truck and with the experience in the field and said, yeah, I'm going to go do something, make something of myself. And so live, live in the American dream, right? That's right. And how, how fortunate we are to live in America where it's an option for individuals to own their mineral rights. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Justin. Um, I, it's been enjoyable learning a little bit more about your background, and I'm sure the listeners um, feel that way as well. And uh, if you want to, again, find out more about the show, go to mineralrightspodcast.com. You can send us an email at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com or leave a comment uh, in the show notes section. And um, yeah, please go to wherever you Um, listen to podcasts and leave a rating and review. Thanks again, Justin. I appreciate your time and we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Matt. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.